Okay, perfect. Um, so we are at the Preservation League. We are your statewide historic preservation nonprofit. And we travel all around the state, uh, usually under normal circumstances, uh, bringing our advocacy for historic preservation to all regions in New York. Our goal is to protect our historic and cultural assets when it comes to community revitalization and also sustainable economic growth. Uh, we typically visit all 62 counties um, and we're able to do this with our tight network of preservation colleagues. Uh, we have colleagues that have preservation nonprofits all across the state and we rely on them heavily to tell us what is important to them in terms of historic preservation and how we might be able to uh, be useful in that realm. Other services we offer, we're available for technical services and assistance, whether you're an individual, a developer uh, that has questions about historic properties or a municipality or a nonprofit, we're here to help in that as well. We are also really big on uh, rewarding and awarding uh, historic uh, preservation projects that are um, of importance on a statewide level, and we do that with our excellence awards. We have just closed our nomination process for those for 2020, and we look forward to awarding some really great projects uh, this year. Uh, the other thing we do is bring uh, advocacy efforts to Seven to Save, which is our biennial program that highlights our threatened resources all across New York State. Uh, what I work on mostly at the League is I do public policy, and as you may know, a lot of our policy work has a focus on historic tax credits. Uh, the League is one of the lead organizations advocating for the historic tax credit here in New York, and we work really hard to try to make sure that that's a useful program and that it stays robust and it stays usable here in New York. So we're big promoters of that, and hence why we're coming to you today to try to bring some of that information to you. And lastly, we do have a loan program for endangered properties where we can give low interest loans. And then our grant program is a partnership with the New York State Council on the Arts. And those would be our Preserve New York and our technical assistance programs. Just to give you a quick overview on how those programs work, uh, they are available to nonprofits and municipalities in New York State. And there are some requirements, but our Preserve New York grants generally give out between three and $10,000 and a 20% cash match is required. While we don't fund bricks and mortar, unfortunately, uh, we are able to fund things uh, for projects such as cultural resource surveys, building condition reports, historic structure reports, and cultural landscape reports. Um, if you're eligible and interested as a nonprofit or municipality, we'd love for you to check out our website on that. And here's just highlighting a recent 2019 award we gave to the Seward House Museum uh, for a building condition report for 10,000. Our smaller but also useful grant program with NISCA is our technical assistance grants. And these kind of cater to a very specific, um, a very specific condition or something like an engineering structural analysis or feasibility or reuse study uh, that you might want to complete on your project. So again, here's highlighting a, um, a technical assistance grant uh, of $4,000 to do an exterior building condition survey to see what needs to be done with a specific property. Again, this is going to have requirements, the biggest of which being that you must be a nonprofit or municipality uh, to apply. So the reason we're all here, historic tax credits. Um, what is so important about historic tax credits? Well, one thing that's really important to highlight is it's one of very few financial incentives available for historic preservation. Uh, there's a lot of us who would love to preserve architecture that's unique to a community or provides a sense of place. However, this is often um, troubling when we get into the numbers of things and the numbers have to work to make a project successful. Another thing it does is it encourages private reinvestment and revitalizes our communities, as well as drives economic development in New York State. It's a great economic development tool and can be particularly helpful, especially facing the challenges we're facing today. It's a job creator and it's a common sense dollar for dollar investment uh, that you're making in a New York State rehab project. One thing that's also really important is it really helps you reuse the existing building stock. Uh, which means you're going to be able to, in, uh, to uh, excuse me, maintain embodied energy and keep materials out of the landfills and assist with our climate-based energy initiatives here in New York State, which are pretty aggressive. So these are all reasons uh, the historic tax credit is important. I know many of you recognize that and you're here uh, for these very reasons. 
And we just wanted to be able to highlight some of these things uh, for you and hope it will help you in your, in your project journey. Uh, so here's how to reach us. Uh, there's my email if you guys have any questions and follow up to this uh, webinar. Uh, we'll be going through the webinar. Uh, Jason's going to give a great presentation. And if you're thinking of questions as we go along, feel free to type in your question using the Q&A feature. Um, also, at the conclusion of Jason's program, uh, you will have the opportunity to raise your hand uh, by hitting the button and to verbally ask your question. And we should be able to answer a few that way as well. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, fear not, there'll be a follow-up email uh, with some additional information and a copy of our slides, and hopefully we can get any last-minute questions answered for you. So just to give a little introduction to Jason, uh, he's, as I mentioned, he's been a tax credit attorney for over 20 years. He's currently a partner at the Rochester firm of Borelli and Yachts. And since 2008, Jason has been a principal of Preservation Studios, which is a historic preservation consulting firm in Buffalo. In 2011, he founded the Common Bond Real Estate Agency to pursue adaptive reuse projects in Western New York. Currently, he's living in Buffalo uh, with his family. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason and have him impart uh, all this knowledge that he has about commercial tax credit. Thank you to the League and for Christina for it involving me in this. This is a, really a fantastic way to present, I think, a lot of information to as many people as possible. Um, it, it's, it's just, it's, it's a good, I like the medium. Um, I won't go through my bio, but I will say that anything I've ever accomplished, um, I have accomplished uh, through my partners and with my partners. Um, Phil Borelli, my partner, my law partner in Rochester, Mike Puma and Derek King are my partners and, and consulting partners in uh, Buffalo, along with uh, my dad, who um, was the founder of Preservation Studios back in 2002 and continues to play a very active role with us, Tom Yachts. And then I've had many real estate partners that have uh, made me look good over my last couple of transactions, and so I really would feel uh, remiss if I didn't mention that. Um, just very quickly, I'm going to introduce the federal and state tax credit programs, historic tax credit programs. Um, I'll try not to duplicate uh, too much of what Christina did because I thought that was a really good intro on the big picture stuff. I'm also going to jump right into something called syndication, which is the way that you take tax credits and turn them into money for your project. Um, it's kind of a complex topic to jump right into, but 999 of 1,000 projects probably seek to syndicate, and so we might as well run through that. And I find it's best to, um, uh, to show how the program works through a case study, and so I walk through a slightly fictionalized version of my first project and kind of show you the mechanics of the program and how it enabled us to take an infeasible project and make it possible. And then um, if I can stay on course here, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, the federal program has been around since the late 70s. Um, it has, it's a big investment uh, boost for a lot of, uh, particularly Rust Belt and other communities that have a lot of older buildings hundred billion dollars in just tax credit only investment in the last uh, throughout the program. Big job and housing creator. Um, these are both well-paying contemporary construction jobs and, and sophisticated trades as well as good professional jobs as well as permanent jobs of all types from service to office to um, hotel to any anything you can think of you historic tax credits can do. Um, it is a housing creator but it's really not known as such an effective affordable housing creator, and it really is. It's sort of a the silent affordable housing subsidy that rides along on a lot of deals um, that HUD would consider to be affordable. Um, and you know, we're, we're we're pretty proud of that aspect of the program. Um, this I'm just gonna move this if I can because it's like right in the middle of all my stuff. Um, this is not gonna move. Is a slide that is essentially shows over the course of the lifetime of the program. Um, with obvious peaks and valleys for uh, economic uh, booms and busts, the project, the number of projects which are in red, you know, since the 90s has remained fairly um, consistent year to year, but the amount of investment generated from the tax credits for those projects, the projects are getting larger and larger and larger. This is partly a function of syndication, which, you know, is probably one of the purest forms of capitalism and just always seeks to be more efficient and, and larger. Um, but it's also a function of the program doesn't work very efficiently at the lower levels in the sense because there are a lot of built-in costs and a, and a lot of brain damage that smaller projects don't always justify. Um, and, can, uh, oops, sorry folks. 
Um, so just quickly, the, the federal tax credit pro program highlights, it, it, after it was um, created in the late 70s, it was trimmed back a bit in the 80s, both in terms of the credit that was allowed and, and the blocking or plugging of a number of partnership tax loopholes that just made the credit less attractive to investors. And if you look back at the chart, you'll see a dip in usage right after that. Um, and I, we, will, we will be sharing this PowerPoint for anyone if I'm talking too fast or if anyone's worried about taking notes, you'll be able to grab these slides as well. Um, so then we went through a bit of a rough patch in the 2012 to 2015, the industry was sort of sidelined by a, a really tough, uh, from an industry perspective, tax case that essentially called into question the way that we had been doing business for the previous couple decades. Really chilled the market, investment market, and, and in addition to other things that were going on, it was not a good time to be in this business. The IRS tried to at least get the market a little warmer by issuing a safe harbor, and that did help a lot. And since then, um, you know, the risks of the historic boardwalk hall case have, have, are, are much more finite um, if they exist at all at this point. Um, but also, uh, there was a dark cloud kind of hanging over that whole period, which was the way that the IRS was treating um, pass-through leases, which is one, I'll show you later, one of the mechanisms we use for turning credits into money. And so, um, the IRS issued some guidance or some clarified some regulations that really almost cleared up the issue and allowed um, investors to kind of normalize in uh, pricing. And, and so, things have gotten a lot better up until about three months ago. Um, Congress, uh, when Congress flipped, they tried to eliminate the historic tax credit entirely in 2017, um, thankfully due to the fact that the credit enjoys significant bipartisan support and due to the excellent work of folks like the League and uh, the Historic Tax Credit Coalition and the National Trust. They were able to preserve the federal credit as a five-year credit. It had previously been a very lucrative one-year credit. Um, that's definitely reduced pricing a bit, but for reasons we'll discuss later, the state credit has come up a bit, and that's really kind of balanced things out. They also eliminated the 10 or the 10 percent historic non-historic credit, um, which was for buildings older than 1936 or four um, that were not otherwise eligible for the 20 percent credit. That was kind of one of my favorite credits because it allowed you to use it on things like ugly old warehouses and partial complexes and things like that, and still get a little bit of equity for your efforts. Um, the good news is, and this slide's not even current, um, the, the Infrastructure Act that was proposed uh, by the House a week or so ago includes significant historic tax credit improvements, um, including enhancements that would allow it or make it easier for nonprofits to use their pro, uh, the program for their own programs, which right now is a, is a, is a bit of a sticky wicket to get through. Uh, New York's program, I put this together mostly from memory, so if I didn't have these dates right, I hope the league won't hold it against me, but um, 2007, we got kind of a worthless credit, but most of the first credits are worthless. It's a $100,000 cap, effectively 6%. People took it, but it wasn't making a lot of deal decisions. Um, in 2010, um, thanks to the good work of a number of folks at those table, we were able to get um, a credit that matched the federal credit and also a very significant per project cap, higher than most in the country, actually. That has, I think, been one of the most, the single most um, deciding factors in Buffalo's recent real estate boom is the, is the New York State Historic Tax Credit, if I had to guess. Um, it also allowed banks and insurance companies to claim the credit for the first time, which was a little bit of a snafu in the original rollout, and that really opened the market up, and then regional banks suddenly had a lot of reasons to be involved in historic deals. Um, so, uh, New York's tax credits became refundable, meaning that if you can't use them as of 2015, you can get a refund of cash similar to any refund you would get on your own personal taxes. That makes it easier to bring out of state investors in who don't have New York income tax and it allows them to take the federal credit and then monetize the refund in a way that works for everyone. It, it, is, it, it has helped a lot in that way. It's worked as, as designed. They also have boosted up the area median income restrictions so that now you can use this credit in any census tract that is at or below 100% of the AMI as opposed to the previous cap of 80%. And we got the program extended to 2024. Not me, I didn't have anything to do with it, but the industry did. Um, the New York credits were decoupled from the federal credits, which for those of us who've been waiting for something called bifurcation sounded really exciting, but it is not that at all. It's really just saying, if the federal credit is a one-year or five-year credit, your New York credit is a, still a one-year credit until the New York legislature changed that. So 
um, as the parenthetical suggests. So uh, this presentation is intended to have some slides that if you're starting your first tax credit deal or your client is, you can print these out and ask these questions on a conference call and actually probably get a pretty good start. Um, you know, it probably sounds axiomatic to people that are on this call, but your building has to qualify and many, many, many don't. And it's not just because it's old and not just because it's pretty. And sometimes because it's not that old and sometimes because it's really ugly. <laughs> so you never really know, but it helps to call the SHPO. They're very accessible, but also very busy. Um, you can certainly call, um, like my partners, Mike or Derek at Preservation Studios, with no obligation, we'll take a look at a building and let you know what we think. Um, the, uh, but it's not just your building, your, your rehab plans have to qualify. You can't, you know, there's this misconception among novices that, oh, I only have to worry about the outside of the building. That this is such a deep subsidy that the federal government and the state governments have an awful lot of input into what you do with the building to make sure that you don't violate something called the Department of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, which, although there are only a handful of them, um, you know, are very uh, determinative as to how your design is going to have to look. Um, depends a lot on the building type, too. Um, this is a good spot where you want to estimate your project cost, even if it's back of the napkin, um, even if it's a square footage assumption or, or, or whatever, based on experience, because you have to pass something called the Substantial Rehabilitation Test, which I'm going to talk about on the next slide. And it's a threshold that if you can't pass that test, it doesn't matter what one or two say, your project's not going to qualify for tax credits. Um, the, the, the extra bonus of doing that is that you can also determine how much historic tax credits you can earn to determine whether going through all of this is actually worth the trouble. And that's what the point you're making your financing plan. You already, tr traditional real estate projects, our developers are familiar with like, um, construction and permanent loans, um, maybe even soft loans from the government. IDA leases. Well, historic tax credits come in as an investment, and so you have to figure out how that investment is going to sit in your capital stack, as it's called, and determine whether these, if you still have a gap, or whether these, this, is, this subsidy really does it for you. Um, similar to good partners, you have to have a good team. The team has to be rowing in the right direction, and it has to be, if not experienced, quick learners. <laughs> um, your architect and contractor generally will save your life in your investment probably a hundred times over the course of two years and if if you treat them like a teammate and they're part of the part of the group they you you'll stay out of trouble in these historic deals because you have a lot of unforeseen circumstances and you also have some best guesses that you have to make and both your architect and contractor are going to be the folks that are going to be fixing those problems when you're in month four of construction um, your accountant and attorney, very useful up front and at the back end to help you get into the financings and figure out the credits and get out of the finance or get out of the construction into your tax returns and get your permanent loan and your project stabilized. And so you really can't do without the top four. I happen to have a couple of these built into my team and, and a lot of folks do, but you, as, long as, as long as they're fair to you, this is always a good use of money. I put a question mark next to the historic preservation consultants. Might seem a little curious for a historic preservation consultant to do that, but depending on the capabilities of the rest of your team, you may or may not need a preservation studios or a McRosty or one of these other firms. Um, you know, you might be able to get by with um, you know the, the experience of your team, or or in some cases of some of our developer clients, their own experience. So the substantial rehabilitation test was put in by the by Congress to make sure that you didn't do a little bit of rehab and take out federal incentive and not really do what the incentive was intended to incentivize, which is, is secure and save a historic building. So they decided that you needed to spend more on tax credit eligible work than you already had as tax basis in the building. So the translation of that is you take all of your hard costs, your construction costs, and your costs like your architecture and things related to construction, a reasonable developer fee, let's just say 10% of everything for now. And that's got to be more than your adjusted tax basis, which when you buy a building day one is generally going to be your arm's length purchase price minus the land value. But if you've owned it for a while, it's going to be a more complicated um, question for your accountant to figure out how much depreciation you had, what have you done for capital improvements, the good news is in upstate New York, this rarely is a problem because our land costs are so low and our construction costs are so high. It's very difficult unless you're buying an existing, say, a hotel that you're upgrading or apartment building that's already filled to run into a situation where you're spending $2 million on acquisition and $1.9 where you wouldn't qualify. So the game here is buy low, spend high, 
in high coastal areas, high cost areas, you have to look really hard at this. New York City is it's a big problem because acquisition costs are so high. Okay, that was the program, and I'm going as fast as I can. I think we're doing okay. Um, so syndication basics, essentially syndication refers to the process where you, well, syndication generally just means selling something through some sort of syndicate, but in this case, it's the, the sale of um, real estate tax, or real estate uh, upside and downside through uh, partnership structures. And so um, this is about as simple as a historic tax credit syndication structure gets. You form an LLC to own your building. The sponsored developer type um, is gonna be the, well, I say project developer, the managing member. They're gonna have a very nominal interest in the project, which is counterintuitive to people who do traditional real estate deals where your ownership is generally more pro rata with your skin in the game. That's because we have to get the maximum amount of historic tax credits out to this investor who's become your partner for five years. So the law allows us to give them 99% of the credits, but it also requires them to have 99% of everything else. So before you think they get 99% of everything you're doing for five years, we could talk about that offline because there are an awful lot of ways to structure these deals that make it look like a regular deal, satisfy the safe harbor, and get your tax credit investor the things that they're bargaining for. This is the still this is still not as, <laughs> as complicated as certainly the things my associate rich rogers and i've been working on recently but this is a, what's called a master lease pass-through structure this is where you separate on the left hand side your land deal your real estate your debt all that stuff your idea from your tax credit investment structure which is moved down i call it downstream through a lease so that your tax credit investor and all your tenants and everything are sort of down here siloed in in this master tenant um area the structure stays in place for five years again we we use a number of different conventions to replicate typical real estate um functions and flows but um this is a little bit more complicated structure um, as a developer you're rarely going to have to worry about structuring any of this stuff as an accountant or an attorney or a consultant you likely will have to know this as a developer just say where do i sign um so these are kind of it i'm not going to go through all this this is way too much information but this is for later uh, um I, I i attempted to show what the industry standard was for a number of different negotiation points versus what happened after the revenue procedure so the safe harbor so your takeaway from this is if you're currently structuring on a piece of paper your historic tax credit deal and you're not sure what else to do the after reg proc 2014 12 really kind of gives you your this is where you're gonna to need to be. This is what you can expect for a minimum ownership interest, which would be 1%. You're gonna have 20% of your investors um, equity contributed um, prior to the placement and service of the project. So you can start to bank on these things. The safe harbor made some of these things more knowable for reasons completely unrelated to clarity. Um, and then you can kind of go through all these things and sort of see that this is a, a lot of meat here for this short presentation, but um, this was just trying to give you a feel for how, how, um, what you need to look at for the safe harbor. So um, very quickly, this, the left hand side of this for the most part looks like any other real estate checklist when you're trying to convince a lender or an investor or even your own partners to get involved. Do you have site control? Is it contaminated? In this case, if it's a tax credit project, where are you on that long, long approval process? Do you have anything that shows the value of the property? Have you started your plans? Have you even hired an architect? Are you at, how long will it be before you get a building permit? Um, if you have commercial space, have you pre-leased that? This is more relevant now than ever with uh, COVID-19 as underwriters are really zeroing out any space that if, is essentially anything that's waiting till phase four at this point, most banks aren't even underwriting as an actual revenue source um as sad as that sounds even with pre-leasing developer projections this is going to be your snapshot of what you think these tax credits are going to do of, of what your project's going to look like and what you think the credits are going to do for you you can do this with a consultant or you can do it yourself do you have loan commitments have you done your qre estimate bridge financing we're going to talk about that when we look at the case study very very important unless you are an extremely well capitalized developer and and, the, and also want to use the money for that um, do you have a property tax abatement? There is not a single historic rehab project in all of upstate New York, I would venture, that does not have a property tax abatement because of the, the load of our taxes. It's a non-starter for the most part to pay full taxes on a fully rehabilitated building in a market like Buffalo. I think, 
I think our full tax load on our building right now would be, if, if we didn't have an abatement, would be over $100,000 a year. And it's abated at about $28,000. Um, so just to give you some sense, let me, I'll tell you, my cash flow doesn't, wouldn't pick up the rest of that if you were wondering. Um, so then on the tax credit side, you need to know what you're talking to your investor about. When, when, once Buffalo Rising or, or your the Syracuse equivalent announces your project, very smart investment folks who are doing acquisitions um, for their investors are going to start calling you and asking you about your project. And it helps to be able to ask them a series of questions to determine whether or not they're serious about being, at, being in New York to investing in your deal. And three, um, you know, will they be good partners? So you can run through these um, quite, or these points and just say, hey, well, do you use a single tier or a mass release? What's your gross pricing generally? Um, skip cash flow sharing. They would hate that. What's your preferred return? What you're generally going to have for a put at that pricing? Any special guarantees we should know about? How do you treat construction risk? Who do you use for lawyers and accountants? On their own side, because the investors will bring their own set of lawyers and accountants that you will pay for, um, and they generally come from large law firms and large accounting firms, and that's expensive. You should know how much that's going to cost. That's going to reduce the value of your historic tax credit. Safe harbor compliance. Most <laughs> most investors uh, spend their days and nights worrying about safe harbor compliance. So this is not something that, that anyone's going to say, oh, we don't worry about the safe harbor. But some folks treat safe harbor risk differently. Some will just say, give me an appraisal to show me we're okay. Some will really want to dive into the local market and understand what's going on there. Sorry, I'm getting a cool air guys from my window. Okay, this is why you need a bridge loan. When you get tax credit investment, let's say you get a million dollar tax credit investment, and I'll show you an actual scenario in a second, but the, the name of the game is they hang on to the, the investor hangs on to their money for as long as possible because that burns off construction risk and stabilization risk, but it also increases their rate of return because they've, they're waiting and waiting and waiting longer to give you your money. The shorter a period of time between when they give you your money and when they claim the credit is a better return. So the safe harbor we saw earlier requires a minimum of 20% of their investment. So what we're normally seeing in markets like Buffalo is 25, because they don't want to be too close, 25 to 35% investment at, long, at investment closing. That would be generally when you start in your project. You should expect not to see any more cash from your tax credit investor unless you've negotiated a construction term installment, which is these days particularly rare and likely going to be a little expensive for you. But you may be able to do it if you're the right team. The rest of your money is essentially going to come from your tax credit investor after you've placed the project in service, earned something called a part three approval, which is the end of your tax credit application process. Received, if you have an institutional investor, you'll need something called a cost certification, which is essentially an audit of what you spent to determine that your QREs and tax credits are what you promised to the investor. And then you're going to need to stabilize your project, which generally means that if you have an amortizing loan, which almost everyone does, that it's started to amortize and it's no longer in its interest only period. That leaves a smidgen of equity that the investor holds back because they don't trust you to do your tax returns and give them their K-1 properly. And then once you do that, um, soon thereafter, they will uh, give you the rest of your money. So you can see, though, that you... The reason you need a bridge loan is unless you're able to bridge, say, 750000 of that million dollar investment, you're going to have to go out and borrow that, maybe secured by the credits coming in, um, and then repay the bridge loan perhaps once they start a tax credit but actually hits, hits your deal. Other folks that better capitalized developers have the ability to bridge that themselves if they choose to use their cash that way. Okay, so I said we were gonna do a case study, and this is something called the Mattress Factory, which is um, a rehab that I did with um, my partner, Carl Frislin, and a group of investor partners um, over in Hamlin Park. Uh, it's, a, it's a National Register Historic District that Preservation Studios uh, helped create. Preservation Studios, uh, uh, Mike Puma in particular, my partner was integral to both this project getting off the ground and the, and the success of it and the, and the really just really baller baller design that we got for, you know, so as I said, you have to have good partners and good consultants and friends. Um, so the history here was that we had a, a bed manufacturing company that had um, essentially stopped manufacturing beds even before the war. Um, there were some wartime uses and other light manufacturing and warehousing after the war. After the war, we bought it from someone who was using it as a commercial salvage warehouse. He actually took care of the building very responsibly, and probably was the reason that it wasn't torn down, um, along with the fact that it's in a local historic district. Um, 
this is what it looked like before we started. Um, it essentially was built in three phases. There was a, the, the, um, the concrete portion was from 1911. 14 years later, they did a massive brick addition. It kind of runs like a crescent along the former Skajakwita Creek in the back. And then there's a 1960s or 70s um, loading dock addition that was put on, uh, I think, I wanted to say 60s there, <laughs> right, Derek? Um, the, so um, this is what I meant when I said, you know, you, you can't just do whatever you want to a historic tax credit building. We, uh, Preservation Studios, Mike Puma worked with uh, Carl Frislin, our architect, and designed sort of this, this um, curving um, uh, apartment layout um, that really moved with the spine of the building, um, left very little um, underutilized space, and one of the nice aspects of it is no apartment on either on, on any given floor is identical. They stack identically for the most part, but everyone has a different layout, um, which is sounds very inefficient from a construction standpoint, but the team got it done. Um, so this is what it looked like before again. Um, it was ba basically a sort of a daylight factory slash warehouse, um, had nice hardwood floors on the second floor, uh, has nice hardwood floors on the second floor. The program requires us to keep things like that. Um, this is what it looks like now. I didn't, I should have put a furnished photo in. I, I just couldn't find one quickly. Um, we were really able to button up the outside and put in, you know, some of these features, uh, like these faux barn doors. Um, you know, the, the Mike came up with it. I really, uh, really like. Um, and then inside, you know, we do fairly simple projects. Um, I'd say we do, uh, you know, historic rehabs with laminate countertops. Uh, so we're not charging you for things you don't need, but um, we still feel that we're giving, you know, a unique product that, that people can feel that they're part of something. Um, this isn't exactly what this project cost, but uh, it cost a little bit more, but uh, that is what we paid for the building. You'll notice that the acquisition cost does not earn you any historic tax credits. QREs are your, your tax credit column on the right-hand side there. Um, hard costs, for the most part, will earn you tax credits. FF and E will not. Uh, sorry, uh, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Um, so we usually discount that when we're estimating, just so you don't assume something that um, my cat's trying to invade my space here. Um, soft costs relating to construction uh, and financing costs relating to construction can, for the most part, be included. This is huge. Um, your architecture fee uh, will be your largest soft cost on any transaction. The fact that you're able to include that along with uh, building engineering is, is, is big. And should be promoted by more architects that their fee isn't really as high as it seems because you can earn some tax credits on it. Um, the, the developer fee, if it's reasonable, and this is a whole nother seminar, but uh, for the most part, if you size it in around 10%, you really can't go wrong I, for now. Um, so that gets you a project that's about $5.8 million with the developer fee or the developer's profit, which by the way, does generally does not get paid for many years. Um, and then it earns you tax credits of about four point or sorry, tax credit basis of about 4.9 million. So quick calculator. Um, you're, you're going to be surprised actually how simple this program really is. Once we get into this, uh, you just take your QREs and you multiply it by 20%. That's your federal tax credit. And then you do the same thing for the state. Um, however, um, tax credits do not, all, all, all tax credits don't syndicate alike. Maybe that's what I'm trying to say. Federal and state tax credits uh, pedal at different rates. And that's in part because of a demand issue, um, supply and demand, simple supply and demand, but also because of uh, tax and the fact that we all don't pay tax at the same tax rates. And so, you know, generally I tell my clients for $2 of credit, you know, your goal on a small project is get to $1.50. On a larger product, product project, you want to push that up as much as another dime or so. But for the most part, this is a buck fifty-four is what we see here. So you take your federal tax credits. As we saw earlier, your investor only owns ninety-nine percent of your project, so that leaves a weird number. You then multiply that by your negotiated discount. In this case, my investor gave me eighty-eight cents for a federal credit, and that gets me to a gross federal equity number. And this is before reducing it for other things that we're not gonna get into today. Um, but the purpose of your budget, this gross number is the number that you wanna use. So that gets almost 850 in federal equity. And this is tax credit equity, this is investment. This is not debt, these are not loans, these are not grants. Um, 
And then you do the same process again. State historic tax credit at this time was selling for a lot less. You might ask why, is it simple supply and demand? Yes, also we pay federal tax on your state credit in the same way that you pay federal tax on that refund when you get it in your personal taxes. We've tried to have this removed, um, but when they, when in 2017, when Congress was looking for every bucket of money to backfill for the ridiculous tax cuts they were trying to pass, um, the idea that we were going to be able to exempt state credit from federal tax became laughable. Um, so the development budget, um, I'm sorry, this is the sources and uses, but the development budget is along the left hand side. This shows you how the member I said earlier. Take a look and see if you pass the substantial rehab test, then determine what the amount of estimated credits does for your deal. So you have a $5.8 million deal. Based on an appraisal that we got, we were able to borrow about four, oh no, okay, <laughs> about $4 million. I guess that gives away the fact that we're done. Um, and, uh, and that left a gap of about $5.8 million. Okay, so no one's gonna weep for the developer fee, so we'll take that out. So that leaves a gap of about $1.3 million. And so we had, um, of course, my battery's dying on my computer. Um, can you hang on just one second? Hey, guys, can you grab me my computer charger? Sorry about that. That was so unprofessional. Um, so we had about $1.5 million in tax credit equity, and we had a gap of about one3 So at the end of the day, we were able to pay ourselves a little bit of developer fee and also balance out our budget. Our, our project has been amortizing um, for the last two and a half years. We've been... Uh, about on average 95 to 100 percent leased since the first couple of months so that's been a really good story for us and um, you know we'll see what post-covid world brings um, so if you if I could just grab an, uh, an extension cord and plug my computer in so that I don't miss the questions I'll be right back <laughs> Great, Jason. Thank you so much for that overview. I think he did a really good job uh, really showing us how these historic tax credit commercial projects can work. And I think especially seeing uh, that real life example was really helpful. So while we're waiting for him to get back, uh, again, if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the Q&A or we can answer some verbal questions in just a moment. But I did have one come in uh, that I wanted to share because I thought it was uh, useful to the larger group. Um, somebody was asking about determining census tracts. Um, if you go onto the New York State Historic Preservation Office website, there is a way through the PRIS system to determine census tracts to get a general idea. But what I would say um, to that is it's definitely best to call the SHPO. Um, while their information is relatively accurate, I think there's instances uh, where it might not be fully accurate and you want to make sure you're getting the best information possible and you don't wanna be deterred if you see something that ends up being incorrect. So the best thing to do is to go to their website and figure out the contact uh, for your county, the county that your project is in, and you'll see a listing for all of their staff members. So once you find the county uh, where the project will be located, if you reach out to the staff member that's listed, they'll be more than happy to go through that street address with you and get you the information that you need to see if you're qualified based on census tract. So I did just wanna mention that. And if other people have questions, feel free to start submitting them or raising your hand and we can call on you. No questions? Are you guys still digesting this? I know it was a lot. <laughs> Give you just another minute. Anthony raised his hand. Are you able to uh, give him oh, audio? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that me? <laughs> Thanks. Um, let me drop out of this presentation. There we go. Go back into this. Sorry, I'm going to stop the share. How about that? Uh, his hand was sort of raised and then went away. So if you click on participants, you should be able to select him and then it will, should give you some options. Yeah, okay. All right. 
Anthony, go ahead. I think you're muted. Are you able to unmute him? It says ask to unmute. So I just click that and. Um... Okay. Oh, hey, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So my question was the one about the census track, Christine. Thank you for answering that. Did the census track apply to commercial? Uh, do the commercial tax credits? Yes. They do? Okay, you didn't go into any of that. For the state credit, yes, they do. The state, only for the state credits? Yes. Okay, so the, I've been having trouble really finding the um, the specific census tracts from the SHPO site uh, through the CRIS uh, website. Um, you know, it doesn't really, it really doesn't break it down enough. We'll see. If you want to shoot me an email, I'll probably let you know by the end of the day. That's great. That's great. Thanks for that. Thank question. you. You're welcome. Okay. Um, so, um, all right. Uh, Jason, next question that just came in uh, Should the building be on a historic list? Um, okay, so yeah, and I did zip through the eligibility part in part because that um, is also a, a seminar of itself. But um, the, there's a couple of different ways to, to, to honor a building. You can have a local landmark or something that's in a local historic district, and that is not necessarily going to mean that you're eligible for historic tax credits unless that local district has a special tax status. So generally what you want to do is talk to the SHPO or a consultant and find out if you're eligible for listing in on the big list, which is the National Register of Historic, of Historic Places. So you're either in there, not in there, but eligible, not in there, but contributing to a district that is in there or eligible is essentially that, or you're in a local historic district that has a tax. But it's also better to have your building qualified that gives you a running start that reduces your consulting costs. If you buy a building that's already in the National Register or in a historic district, your, your, your soft costs will be lower and your process will be smoother. Great, thanks. Uh, anyone else have any questions? Okay. Uh, seeing no questions, um, I'll leave this uh, with you guys. If you want to follow up with either Jason or myself, we'd be happy to field questions after this. Um, or if you have uh, specific project questions that come up down the line, we're happy to help if we can. Uh, again, the State Historic Preservation Office is going to be a great source of help when it comes to determining eligibility and that type of thing. Uh, so again, we're going to follow up with some information that you might also find helpful and we'll also provide the slides. So again, thank you so much, Jason, for being with us today. Um, I think we all learned a lot and I think we want to take it all in and uh, hopefully this was helpful to everyone. So thank you so much. Thanks. And if Email me um, at any point, either now or in the future, with questions. And then I'll just quick, if you want my, uh, the best way to reach me generally during the virus is my cell, 716-440-0521, if you have a quick question as well. Thanks Great. again for this opportunity. Thanks, Jason. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye Take now. Care.